Hello students. As we have finished with general pharmacology, now you will, you will be dealing with the systemic pharmacology. And in the systemic pharmacology, the first system you will be dealing with is autonomic nervous system. In short, it is also called as ANS. And today we will be learning about its introduction. The autonomic nervous system functions largely below the level of consciousness and it controls the visceral functions. Okay, so it is under the level of consciousness. It functions below the level of consciousness and it controls all the visceral functions, all the organs, all the functions of the organs. Viscera means nothing but organs. So the human nervous system can be largely divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Till now, you all must be knowing about the central nervous system which has its two parts that is the nerves arising from the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, and the peripheral nervous system is divided into somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. This autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, which you will be learning soon in detail. What are the differences between somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system? <clears throat> this chart is there in your textbooks. So the organs supplied by these systems Majorly somatic nervous system supply skeletal muscles and autonomic nervous system supply all the organs as we have discussed. The distal most synapses, you must be aware of the term synapses. Synapses means nothing but the junction of two terminals of the neurons. <clears throat> so the distal most synapse of somatic nervous system is present within CNS. And distalmost synapse of autonomic nervous system, it's outside the CNS. Nerve fibers of somatic nervous systems are myelinated. And about autonomic nervous system, preganglionic nerve fibers are myelinated, but postganglionic nerve fibers are non-myelinated. Okay, so ganglion is nothing but a synapse. It can also be called as a synapse. So the nerve... Uh, nerve terminal or the nerve which is present before that ganglia are myelinated and the nerves which are after those ganglions are non-myelinated. Myelin is nothing but the sheath of the nerve, is the cover of the nerve. Uh, the transmitter, the neurotransmitter of somatic nervous system, the efferent transmitter is acetylcholine. Okay, and of autonomic nervous system, it is uh, either acetylcholine or noradrenaline. Effect of nerve section on organ supplied with somatic system, there can be paralysis or atrophy. And with the autonomic nervous system, the activity is maintained. The activity of the organ is maintained. There is no atrophy. Okay, so these are the major differences between somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Now, what are the central autonomic connections? The highest seat regulating autonomic functions is in the hypothalamus. Many autonomic centers like pupillary, vagal, respiratory, etc. are located in the midbrain and medulla in relation to the cranial nerves. Now what are the functions of this autonomic nervous system? What does it control? Now, basically ANS controls different types of functions. So majorly it controls the visceral smooth muscle functioning. Now what are the viscera I am talking about? They are like eyes, bladder, bowel majorly. There are other also. It, it regulates the blood pressure. 
if it is increase it tries to normalize if it is decrease again it tries to raise it up okay then it is responsible for the distribution of the blood flow and tissue perfusion it controls endocrine and exocrine glands as well you must be knowing about the differences between endocrine and exocrine glands and it also controls the metabolic energy production by various mechanisms like uh, glycolysis gluc gluconeogenesis and there are many other things which they are involved in so these are the major things where ans comes into action okay so it functions below the level of consciousness and it controls several key physiological processes now what are the neurotransmitters involved in this autonomic nervous system now firstly what are neurotransmitters neurotransmitters are nothing but the endogenous chemical endogenous means present means secreted or synthesized or present inside the body chemicals which transmit signals which transmit signals from a neuron to a target cell across a synapse synapse is a junction okay a junction between two nerve terminals or junction between a nerve terminal and the receptor okay that is a synapse synapse so neurotransmitter are endogenous chemicals which transmit signals from a neuron to a target cell across a synapse so majorly these three neurotransmitters are involved in peripheral nervous system okay so peripheral nervous system we have seen that it is again of two types that is somatic and autonomic nervous system okay so the neurotransmitters names are acetylcholine norepinephrine and epinephrine now we have seen the central connections of autonomic nervous system now what are the efferents okay means which organs it is supplying to now in the uh, chart we have seen that autonomic system is divided into two subsystems that is sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system many organs receive both the sympathetic as well as parasympathetic innervation and these systems are both of these systems are antagonistic to each other you have learned antagonism in previous lectures of general pharmacology most blood vessels spleen sweat glands hair follicles receive only sympathetic nervous system supply and certain muscles like ciliary muscles bronchial smooth muscle gastric pancreatic glands receive only parasympathetic innervation okay so this is the diagram showing the same about parasympathetic nervous system supplying cardiac smooth muscle glands nerve terminals sympathetic supplying sweat glands sympathetic again are supplying cardiac and smooth muscle glands and nerve terminals sympathetic again supplying to the renal vascular smooth muscles and somatic is supplying to skeletal muscle as we have seen okay this is a general outlay of efferent autonomic nervous system here you can see different organs which are getting supplied by parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system somatic again the skeletal muscles are showed and in parasympathetic majorly parasympathetic means and sympathetic both contributing autonomic nervous system are supplying different organs like heart blood vessels viscera i and glands okay so here the blue ball you can see are these are from arising from the central nervous system okay the green ball which is showing is a nerve terminal second nerve terminal 
and their junction okay so so before the synapse or before the ganglion you can see a presynaptic terminal preganglionic nerve fiber and after that it is a postganglionic nerve fiber so ans that is autonomic nervous system again i am repeating it is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic sympathetic is also called as adrenergic nervous system and parasympathetic is also called as cholinergic nervous system the neurotransmitter involved in sympathetic nervous system are adrenaline and noradrenaline adrenaline is also called as epinephrine and noradrenaline is also called as norepinephrine and parasympathetic neurotransmitter is acetylcholine now these neurotransmitter act over certain receptors so what are the receptor in sympathetic nervous system there are five major types of receptors majorly there are two types of receptor that is alpha and beta so alpha is divided into alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta is divided into beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 these are the major five receptors you will be learning in the further lectures okay and the cholinergic that is parasympathetic nervous system has majorly two types of receptor that is nicotinic types of receptors and muscarinic type of receptors now what are the differences between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system the origin of sympathetic nervous system is dorso lumbar okay and the origin of parasympathetic nervous system is cranio sacral so dorso lumbar means it arises from t1 that is thoracic vertebra t1 till l2 to l3 so the nerves are coming from t1 till l2 or l3 and parasympathetic nerves arise from the spinal cord from which level from the cranial cranial level and the sacral nerves okay so which are the cranial nerves which are involved that is they are third seventh ninth and tenth and the sacral nerves are s2 to s4 sympathetic nervous system has got a wide distribution but parasympathetic nervous system is limited to head neck and trunk the ganglion which are present in sympathetic nervous system are away from the organs so whichever organs it is supplying to sympathetic nervous system is supplying to the ganglion are present away from the organs okay and conversely in parasympathetic nervous system the ganglion are close to the organ okay so you can imagine the preganglionic fiber and postganglionic fiber length so if the sympathetic nervous system the ganglion is away from the organ the preganglionic fiber is short and postganglionic fiber is long conversely in parasympathetic uh, parasympathetic nervous system the ganglion is close to the organ so preganglionic fiber is long and postganglionic fiber is short okay the transmitters involved i have already told you again i'll repeat the transmitter involved in sympathetic nervous system is noradrenaline and sometimes it is acetylcholine and in parasympathetic nervous system it is majorly acetylcholine okay so this differences can be asked in the examination so what is the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system so you should know this differences there is one terminology in uh, autonomic ner nervous system you will be um, dealing with it is enteric nervous system the enteric plexus of the nerves receives inputs from both sympathetic and para parasympathetic division of ans but in addition functions independently to integrate ball movements as well as regulate secretion and absorption 
in short enteric nervous system is a combination of um sympathetic parasympathetic and on its own okay and it is important for the bowel movements it regulates secretion and absorption so what are the functions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system majorly sympathetic um, nervous system is also called as fight and fight of light stimulus and parasympathetic nervous system is also called as rest and digest stimulus the sympathetic nervous system are responsible for tackling stress and emergency that means fight and flight okay and parasympathetics are involved in assimilation of food conservation of energy that means rest and digest and in the center you can see these systems are antagonist antagonistic to each other okay they often oppose the actions of each other one more term you will be um, dealing with in further chapters that is neurohumoral transmission okay means there is a transmission of nerve signals what does that mean so there are majorly five steps involved in this neurohumoral transmission first step is synthesis of neurotransmitter and impulse conduction okay second stage is storage means the neurotransmitter gets stored stored in the presynaptic terminal third the release of this neurotransmitter in the synapse or synaptic cleft fourth is recognition of this neurotransmitter by the receptors or by the sites present on the post synaptic terminal and fifth the metabolism of the of this neurotransmitters okay and we'll see one by one and the first step was impulse conduction and synthesis so what do you mean by impulse conduction the resting transmembrane potential is 70 millivolt negative inside the membrane and is established by high potassium permeability of axonal membrane this is nothing but the revision of physiology which you have learned in first year okay and it's got high axoplasmic concentration of this ion coupled with low sodium permeability causes the attaining of minus 70 millivolt potential inside the cell okay stimulation or arrival of an elect electric impulse causes a sudden increase in sodium conductance it's depolarization you must be aware of these terms that is depolarization and repolarization depolarization is nothing but sodium ions are coming inside and potassium ions are going out of the cell second step was transmitter release once there is a conduction of impulse there is a uh, there the impulse arises on the presynaptic nerve terminal the transmitter which has got synthesized inside the presynaptic terminal gets released okay so the transmitter can be excitatory or inhibitory these are stored in presynaptic vesicles in the prejunctional nerve endings within the synaptic vesicles you can see here in this diagram okay so this red just a sec i'll take a pointer yes so sorry mm yeah now we'll take a pointer okay now here you can see this is a presynaptic terminal okay this is a postsynaptic terminal right now here you can see the vesicles present small four vesicles present these are synaptic vesicles present in the presynaptic terminal 
okay here you can see sodium ions are coming in potassium going out it's an impulse conduction there is an exchange of ions depolarization repolarization there is an exchange of ions happening here okay so the neurotransmitter present in the synaptic vesicle here are excitatory neurotransmitter and here in this nerve terminal are inhibitory neurotransmitter okay so there is a release of neurotransmitter here okay so the neurotransmitter is released here and it is having action on this site of excitatory neurotransmitter and inhibitory neurotransmitter is getting released here and it's having action on this site okay are you getting it so release of excitatory neurotransmitter causes depolarization and excitation of this nerve terminal and release and action of inhibitory neurotransmitter causes hyperpolarization and inhibition of this particular uh, postsynaptic nerve terminal okay so there is a transmitter release nerve impulse promotes fusion of vesicle vesicular and axonal membrane basically those vesicle synaptic vesicles and the presynaptic nerve terminal axon membrane gets fused and there is a release okay and all the contents of vesicle there is transmitter present inside the vesicle there are enzymes and other proteins are extruded by the process of exocytosis in the junctional cleft okay so this space So, this space uh, between the two terminals is called synaptic cleft. Okay. Third process is transmitter action on the post-junctional membrane. So, depending on the type of transmitter, it will produce its action. So, if the neurotransmitter is excitatory, it will produce excitatory postsynaptic potential. And if it is inhibitory, it will produce inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So, excitatory postsynaptic potential means there is an influx of sodium and calcium ions and there is depolarization. Okay, and what is inhibitory? The permeability to chloride ions, negative ions increases and there is a hyperpolarization. Okay, so it will be an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. The fourth process is postjunctional activity. A supra threshold APSP generates a propagated post junctional AP which results in nerve impulse contraction or secretion. Now, nerve impulse happens in the neuron, contraction can, be, can occur in muscles, and secretion happens in obviously glands. Okay, and IPSP that is inhibitory postsynaptic potential stabilizes the post junctional membrane and resists the depolarizing stimulus. So, if there is a depolarization because of excitatory postsynaptic potential because of excitatory neurotransmitters, there will be nerve impulse conduction in the neuron, there will be contraction of the muscles or secretion in the glands. And what if there is IPSP that is inhibitory postsynaptic potential? It will inhibit or it will resist the depolarizing stimulus. So, there will be no secretion, there will be no contraction and there will be no impulse generation or conduction in the neuron. Okay. And the last step is termination or metabolism of transmitter action. Following its combination with the receptor, the transmitter is either locally degraded. Okay. Many a times there is a presence of some enzymes in the synaptic cleft which are responsible for the metabolism of neurotransmitter released in the synaptic cleft. Okay, so for example, acetylcholine is degraded with the help of choline esterase, which is present in the synaptic cleft itself. Okay, so this can be a one way of the metabolism of uh, or, or ending of the function of transmitters, neurotransmitters. Second, it uh, they can partly be taken back into the pre-junctional neuron by active reuptake mechanism 
or else the third mechanism they get diffused away for example noradrenaline so there are three mechanism by which there is a um, stopping of the action of neurotransmitter okay so it can be either locally degraded for example acetylcholine gets degraded with the help of cholinesterase second they can be taken back into the presynaptic nerve terminal by active reuptake mechanism and the third they can be diffused away okay so this was all about the introduction to ans in the next lecture you will be learning about uh, this sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in detail so i hope you have understood so please go through your textbooks read the chapter well and study it well thank you so much